Um, and today we're going to be talking about healthy holiday eating with the wonderful Jocelyn Zubin. Um, we have been blessed to have uh, Jocelyn as our nutrition educator um, for our staff for the past 13 years. She works with our interns and uh, garden educators and as I said, our staff. So we're honored, like I said, to have her join us today and share her wisdom with us. Um, Matt, Jocelyn has a master's degree in nutrition science and has been a registered dietitian for 18 years. Her background is in public health program development, community wellness, executive management, direct to patient nutrition therapy, and community health engagement. Uh, whether working in a hospital, private practice, public health organizations, universities, or the corporate wellness air arena, Jocelyn inspires health and numbers by engendering wellness communities that thrive as they pursue optimum health together. And that's right in line with our Life Lab mission as well. So welcome Jocelyn and thank you for being here. Thank you, I appreciate you having me Nikki and Life Lab, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, so I want to set the stage for our time together today. My main priority is to give you nutrition knowledge that's really practical that you can walk away with and use right away. And at the same time, I want to answer your questions. So if you have questions, I want to make sure that it's a discussion and that you feel like you can actually ask those. So I'll be watching uh, the chat in order to ensure that I'm seeing your questions and can get those answered. Uh, as we're kind of going through this information. But I also want to say that there's not a lot of cut and dry rules in nutrition. So I often say that teaching nutrition education is kind of like teaching someone English, where we say, oh, it's I before E. And we go, wait, except after C. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like that. So you'll hear me say things today. And I wanted to just clarify that some things apply to all foods and other things only apply to certain foods, but you're going to walk away with clarity on what things to incorporate that will keep you healthy, keep you vital, keep you eating straight out of the garden as much as possible, and really help you to feel that vitality that we all seek every day. So I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can follow along and then Let's see here, panelists who can start sharing me. Haven't done it before, I'm the second host. So let's see. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it looks like uh, I have screen sharing options. So let's see if I can do it. All right, All right. can everybody see that? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Hey. All right, so today we're gonna to focus on eating the rainbow and with a spin toward the holidays because I want everyone to stay healthy this time of year. I can't tell you how many years I've had a private practice and January is always the time when people come in, head hung low. Oh, I probably shouldn't have eaten X, Y, and Z so much over the holidays. Can you help me undo all of the effects of that? I want you all to have your best January ever which means I want you to have a really healthy December. So I wanna give you some tips and tricks and strategies that you can use to eat the rainbow and also eat healthy during the holidays. So that being said, we're gonna start by talking about, we're gonna kind of work our way through the rainbow. So we're gonna start by talking about our red foods. So red foods in general have lycopene. And I say in general, because again, it's like teaching the English language, right? I before E except after C. So not all foods are high in lycopene, but many, many, many foods that are red are red because they contain appreciable amounts of lycopene. So what is lycopene? It's an antioxidant. It guards our healthy cells. That's what an antioxidant does. So I often tell people, if you can picture your cells as this little, beautiful, round, healthy portion of your body and that you have trillions of them, and if you can picture that every one of those cells needs to be guarded when anything comes in that might hurt it, each cell is wearing a coat of armor or a suit of armor like a knight. And that is your, your antioxidants. They act like a suit of armor. So I want you to all, as we're talking about all these different nutrients to keep thinking about, oh, that guards my cells. That keeps my cells healthy. That's what an antioxidant really means, okay? So lycopene is an antioxidant, and what it does is it makes up about 50% of the carotenoids in our body. So when we look at our blood, 
a lot of why you see red color in your blood is because of lycopene. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so we know that lycopene reduces the risk of multiple types of cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic, stomach cancer, breast cancer. So for all of those reasons, it's really important to include because we can't prevent but we can reduce risk. And we wanna reduce our risk of all chronic diseases as much as possible. And so the lycopene will definitely do that, eating your red foods. But we also know that it reduces our risk of heart disease. And some of you may have started to see in the bath and beauty sections of our grocery stores and our drug stores, more skincare products actually have tomato in them. That's because they're trying to add more lycopene because we also know it does help with skin staying looking young, skin staying uh, clear of acne. So lycopene has a lot of different imports, but particularly we wanna just focus on eating those red foods to get lots of lycopene. And of all the red foods, tomatoes and tomato products are, are gonna be top of the list. So the more tomato paste, the more uh, fresh tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes that you can incorporate, um, even tomato sauces and salsa, you're gonna get a lot of lycopene in your diet. So what does that mean for the holidays? Well, when we're trying to have lycopene for a healthy holiday, I think that cranberry sauce deserves more than one day. I'm a huge fan of cranberry sauce. So I would, I would really recommend maybe cranberry sauce makes its way into your holiday celebrations for the balance of December so that you're getting some lycopene from that red pigment in the cranberries. I also have a favorite scone recipe which is from a uh, wonderful cookbook author, Issa Chandra Moskowitz, and she makes a tomato rosemary scone, it's delicious. So adding a lot of tomato into the batter so that you end up with a scone that's got a lot of lycopene in it is really a great way to have a nice warm treat on maybe a Sunday morning when you've got some time off from the holidays, relaxing at home. And her cookbook, Vegan Brunch, is the one that I use as a reference for that recipe and it is available at our independent bookstores, which I'm a huge fan of us supporting right now. Um, and then red chard is such a beautiful way to get lycopene. You see that stalk and all the veins throughout the chard, that's all very lycopene rich. So we know when we are eating fresh from the garden, the chard is beautiful and tender and delicious. And the more you can incorporate that red chard, the more you're actually giving yourself some lycopene. So that's a wonderful way for us to really make sure we're incorporating lycopene into the diet. In terms of our orange foods, as we're working through our rainbow, um, of course we know orange foods are most famous for beta carotene, but most people aren't aware that beta carotene is just one type of vitamin A. So when you have orange foods, you're getting a lot of vitamin A, which is a phenomenal support for eye health. No matter what your situation is, if you have perfect vision, if you have cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, there's all sorts of reasons to incorporate more of our orange foods into your diet. Also, vitamin A is a huge support for boosting your immune system. So right now, of course, in a pandemic, we want the strongest immune systems possible, right? So you wanna have a lot of vitamin A in your diet because it helps your white blood cell count to remain more robust and it helps you to fight off any infections or pathogens as we say that may come through. So again, it's not gonna prevent, but it can reduce your risk. And it also will reduce the risk of prostate cancer, esophageal cancer, colon cancer, and can cancers of the mouth and throat. So if you know, huh, I come from a family where there was a lot of prostate cancer and I'm a man in my 40s, 50s, 60s, it's a really, really important time to incorporate more vitamin A into the diet. Maybe you have a history of colon or head and neck cancers in the family. Also a really important thing to incorporate those orange foods into the diet. And if you're just a person who says, I don't want any part of that. It's not in my family now and I don't wanna be the first. That's even more reason to just get those orange foods on board. So of course we know in addition to sweet potatoes, things like our wonderful carrots. And I just love the fact that, you know, in one carrot, you're getting so much vitamin A that you get real, get a lot of support for just your eyes, your immunity and cancer fighting all just in one carrot. Um, in addition, I would love to see more people eating sweet potato pie, of course, pumpkin pies during the holidays. And again, just like the cranberry sauce, 
I just think one day is not enough. So let's extend from just Thanksgiving to incorporating some of that in December as well. And it's a great time of year for soups. So more carrot ginger soup is a beautiful way to get a lot of vitamin A into the diet. And if you're a person that eats fish, wild Alaskan salmon actually has a lot of vitamin A, that orangey pink pigment that you see, that's actually vitamin A creating the coloring for the fish. And so those are wonderful things to incorporate into your holidays. My mother and my sister spent Thanksgiving together and did an outdoor celebration. And they said, no one wanted turkey. So we had salmon. And I said, great, you got your vitamin A. So <laughs> that's a great one to have if you have upcoming holiday celebrations in lieu of kind of the traditional turkey or, or ham. And as we're talking about our yellow foods, a lot of times we think, oh, well, corn is not as healthy. We should steer clear of it or kind of minimize it. But actually corn is very, very high in lutein. And lutein is phenomenally important for the eyes and overall eye health. So I do encourage corn as one of the foods that you incorporate, especially in our fall and winter months when it's the harvest time for corn. And in particular, when we're talking about what that lutein does, if you look in the mirror and you look at your eye, no matter what your eye color, you'll see a little bit of yellow right in the center of the eye. That yellow is lutein. That lutein is from the foods that you eat that are yellow in color. And that is a really important protector against blue light. Where do we get the most blue light? Looking at these screens, right? All day, we're on a screen, phone, computer, laptop, tablet, Kindles, so we wanna make sure we're guarding our macula of the eye against damage. And the lutein actually helps to guard the macula against the damage from the blue light. It also improves our overall vision to have more lutein in the diet. Um, I just went in for my eye exam last month and I was really happy to see that the vision in my left eye actually improved. And of course, I'm always working on my nutrition, but. I know that in part that's because I did increase my intake of lutein. And then I also want to make, make it really clear that, you know, again, we can't prevent. So if you're a person that says, oh, well, I already have had cataracts or I have a cataracts right now, having the lutein is not going to take a cataracts away. But if you don't already have cataracts, it's actually going to reduce the risk of getting it. And if you do have cataracts, it will make the clouding slower to occur. And so that's a really important piece too, to just know that we're doing everything we can to be healthy. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Perfection is a misnomer, but let's use all the tools in our food toolbox, so to speak, to keep as healthy as possible. So what are some fun ways to incorporate our yellow foods during the holidays? Well, one of my favorites is making skillet cornbread in a cast iron skillet. Uh, and I love to start from using an organic whole cornmeal, but then adding actual kernels of corn into my cornbread so that you get some difference of texture. You can also turn to yellow split peas. That's a great source of lutein. That yellow color signifies a lot of lutein and make a doll or a kitchery. And that's another great thing this time of year. Again, our soups and stews really come into play right now. So that's another healthy holiday food that I would highly encourage. I'm gonna pause for a moment and see if I can't check out your questions um, at the same time so that if anyone's got questions, of course I can look at them at the end too, um, but I wanna make sure that I'm paying attention to questions. So let's see here. There is one um, question about, um, getting a copy of the slideshow at the end. And I, I sure. want to just let people know we are recording and the recording will be available um, as well on our website and YouTube. So um, I don't know how you feel about sharing the, the actual slides. I'll let you answer That's that. perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I am seeing a question here about, you know, foods from other cultures and yes, absolutely having things like the kitchery on board, um, making sure that you're incorporating things that are really personal to you and family recipes. And sometimes a spin on those family recipes 
being able to say, well, that makes sense to just add kernel corn into this wonderful traditional stew that my family makes, or, oh, I could add chunks of sweet potato in to that dish where usually we might leave them out, but there is a starch present anyway, so it wouldn't greatly change the texture or the flavor. And so, yeah, I think it is very important for us to make sure that we're really speaking to all of our different historical experiences of the holidays and how to make those as healthy as possible. Um, and yes, yeah, someone said great Indian food and I'm all for it. <laughs> yes, let's do as much as we can to, you know, sneak those vegetables into our samosas and our dolls and so forth. Um, and to make sure that we're getting as much nutrients per bite as possible. So it looks like there aren't other questions about the foods we've covered so far, the nutrients we've covered so far, um, and the colors we've covered so far. So let's move forward and please keep the questions coming. I'm happy to answer them. So when we're talking about our green foods, green foods have chlorophyll. Now chlorophyll is a really intricate and interesting molecule. And in the center of that chlorophyll molecule is magnesium. So it's almost like looking at a spider web and the very center of the web, you go, oh, look at how cool that perfect circle is. Well, that's where the magnesium is in a chlorophyll molecule. And what magnesium does is it imparts that green color. So you get the photosynthesis of the plant and the uh, interaction with the chlorophyll, and that's creating that green color. When you're at the store or when you're on the farm, you want to try to look for your deepest, darkest green vegetables possible for picking. So what I mean by that is I have here red leaf lettuce, and I also have some uh, green chard. I want you to really look for the leaves that are dark as opposed to ones that have yellowed. And it would be more chlorophyll rich for you to have the chard than it would for you to have the red leaf lettuce. That doesn't mean red leaf lettuce isn't healthy. It just means that you can see here from the white stalks versus the green, that there's more green color throughout the charred plant, which means more chlorophyll, more magnesium. So in the store, I sometimes see the broccoli is starting to get a little yellow, or it might actually be somewhat brown. That, that means it's lost a lot of its chlorophyll which means it's not as healthy for you as that deep, dark, almost blackish green broccoli stalk that you might get from the store. So just some tips and tricks on how to pick those vegetables when you're actually at the store or when to pick them at the farm. In terms of what that chlorophyll does for us, um, the magnesium within the center of that chlorophyll is phenomenal for helping us regulate our blood pressure. So whether you're a person that tends toward low blood pressure or high or normal blood pressure, as we age, blood pressure tends to go up. And so we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep it in the healthy range. The more dark leafy greens, the better, because you'll have more magnesium, more chlorophyll, and that'll help to keep the blood pressure lower. It also helps regulate blood sugar. So if you're a person who's been diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes, or there's diabetes in your family, it's a really wonderful thing to just really pack the diet full of the magnesium rich vegetables so that you can help to bring that blood sugar level lower. Of course, that's one strategy among many that we can use for regulating blood pressure and blood sugar, but it is really an important one. And we know that the chlorophyll supports the nervous system and not just our nervous system in our brain and our spinal cord, which is what most people think of, as the nervous system, but did you know we have more of a nervous system in our digest digestive system than we do in our brains? It's really phenomenal. And so we actually call the gut, the gut brain. And when someone says, I have butterflies in my stomach or I have a nervous feeling or I have a gut feeling and they hold their belly, it's very anatomically correct because we do have more nerves in the digestive system than we do in the brain. And so that magnesium is nourishing not only our brain and spinal column and creating more calm in times where there might be a tendency toward more anxiety, but it is also helping for us to have regular bowel movements, not too slow, not too firm, not too often, and not too infrequent because that magnesium is nourishing the intestines. So that's a really important use of it too. And of course, I'm sure many of you have experienced having a Charlie horse, which is a terrible thing. And why do they always happen in the middle of the night? 
<laughs> so that's typically a deficiency in both potassium and magnesium, but most people forget that it's a deficiency in magnesium and they say, oh, I need to eat bananas. And that's a potassium source. But I want you to really emphasize your dark leafy greens if you get frequent muscle cramps because it will actually cut down on the amount of cramping you experience if you can bring your magnesium blood levels up. And it helps to make every protein in our body, it helps to create our bones, and it even helps make our DNA, which is just phenomenal. So at the core of our being is incorporating that magnesium. It's a really important mineral in a lot of different uh, interactions that occur in the body. And we get that when we incorporate the chlorophyll from all of these beautiful greens. So I wanna make sure that you've got your magnesium over the holidays, keeping your holidays as healthy as possible. So one of my very, very favorite foods on the planet is collard greens. And I know they're on the farm and I love seeing them up at Life Lab. And they're, this is the time of year where they're just beautiful and huge and they're so tender and great. So I highly recommend uh, creating collard green based recipes, whether that's uh, stewed collard greens, stir fried collard greens, collard greens in soups. Um, and some people will even make collard green wraps where they will separate the leaves from the center stalk and then they will steam them. And then you can actually put anything inside, proteins, roasted vegetables, um, but it ends up being a really nice way to have collard greens more often. Uh, chard and kale and spinach and arugula, dark leaf lettuces like your red leaf. And so even though these aren't entirely green, we got a lot of nice green color there. And so that's uh, important. And then of course our fresh green herbs, like I talked about our rosemary tomato scones, you can use basil, thyme, oregano, any of those dark green colored herbs are great for getting the chlorophyll into your holiday recipes. So I know that I add a lot of herbs into my cornbread stuffing. So I'll first make fresh cornbread. I'll add my corn kernels in when I'm making the batch. And then once it's made and cooled, I will actually spend almost an hour just prepping herbs and chopping lots of herbs to then saute in and incorporate into that stuffing. So the more green inside that stuffing, the better for the chlorophyll. I'm gonna do a check again and see if we've got more questions so I can kind of answer them as we go. Um, someone's asking about, will I be able to share any cultural recipes with us? Um, I can share with you my collard green recipe and I make that vegan for people who are both vegan and who are not. I do vegan as the default. Um, and then of course there are many, many recipes depending on what your traditions are available online. Um, and so I will share the collard green recipe with you, but it might be fun to do a recipe exchange among the uh, participants that are here today. I'll let Nikki figure out if that's workable. Uh, and then in terms of uh, high blood pressure, yeah, I'm happy to share info about how to help regulate blood pressure. And of course, magnesium is a very, very important piece of that. And most people don't get their magnesium levels checked. When you go to the doctor and you have your standard physical annually, or even go for problem visits. That's not one of the things that will often be mentioned by a doctor is, oh, let's check your magnesium. So if you are experiencing high blood pressure, or you are experiencing high blood sugar, or frequent muscle cramps that aren't going away, you may want to request from your doctor, will you please check my red blood cell magnesium, which is not just your magnesium, it's specifically red blood cell magnesium. We're looking at the magnesium in the red blood cells. That's much more indicative of what your status is. It's kind of like saying, oh, well, if I want to know how much money I have, I can just look at my wallet. No, 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 no. We got to go to the bank and see what's going on in the checking in the savings account. So that's what happens when we're looking at red blood cell magnesium is you're looking at the checking in the savings account. And so, yes, I will give the collard res recipe. And uh, there's a question, is it better to eat the items raw uh, it depends on your digestion. So for each person, they're going to have a different experience of how their, their gut behaves daily. I would not recommend raw collards for most people because most people I've worked with, that's a little too tough on the body. You want to use heat or acid or both to break down some of those insoluble fibers so that it's easier on your digestion. So when I cook my collards, I cook my collards for two hours, but they're simmering on low. 
and they're really starting to break down because I add apple cider vinegar. So that's an acid. They break down slowly as opposed to some people just like to steam them for three minutes and say, I like them really fresh. That's fine. But I noticed that digestively, my family does better when they're softer and my daughter will eat them more if they're softer. So I tend to cook mine a little longer, but there's lots of different methods depending on each person and what recipe they're using, um, how they might like their collard greens. Um, and then yes, someone said sometimes raw food is hard um, on the teeth. And so yes, breaking them down with heat and acid can be really important when you're uh, elderly and you are having any problems uh, with dentition or with your teeth. So in terms of looking at um, one of my favorite categories of the rainbow is our blue foods, mostly because we find that, wow, it's pretty unique to find blue foods in nature, but they're so beautiful when we do. And I have to tell you the best blueberries I've ever had are the ones up at UCSC. I just love the blueberries from the farm there, they're delicious. Um, so what we get when we eat blue foods is we get anthocyanins. And what anthocyanins are is they are also an antioxidant, again, armor around our healthy cells. What we know about antioxidants such as anthocyanins is that a lot of these were discovered by accident. And a lot of them were discovered because someone experienced a pretty serious deficiency and we knew we had to address the deficiency. So with anthocyanins, years and years ago, when this country first was developed, we had soldiers that were fighting, they are fighting wars. And a lot of them were trying to sneak around and do a lot of their reconnaissance at night. And a lot of the generals were seeing that these soldiers were injuring themselves. They were not seeing well at night. And it was really unclear, why are they not seeing well at night? They seem to be fine during the daytime. Well, it turned out that their diets were really poor. And in particular, they were low in those blue foods, those anthocyanins. So a lot of soldiers started taking bilberry, which is a cousin to the blueberry, in the form of tea. And that bilberry started to restore their night vision. So we then learned, oh, well, blue foods help with night vision. And so now, of course, we've got blueberries aplenty all year long, especially in California. But I really encourage having them as much as possible to really get a lot of anthocyanins into the diet so that you can keep your night vision as healthy as possible. Also, the anthocyanins get more oxygen to the eyes in general. So even if you say, oh, well, my night vision is not the problem, but I have glaucoma or I have macular degeneration, you want to get more oxygen to the eyes. Maybe you just have dry eyes. That also is an issue of needing more anthocyanins in part. So I would, I would highly recommend more blue foods for overall eye health. Also, we know that there are studies confirming that anthocyanins, when they're high in the diet, reduce the risk and the severity of colon cancer, breast cancer, esophageal cancer. And so again, going back to, we can't prevent, but let's reduce risk as much as we can. And so having those blue foods will help to do that. And it will also help to improve blood sugar and cholesterol for people who already have diabetes. Those are the populations that we find that's very, very hard to keep the blood sugar lower. It's very hard to get the cholesterol under control without high doses of medication, but the blue foods can help to do that because again, they are protecting our healthy cells. And if our cells function better, they can actually do all the things that they are tasked to do in a day. And interestingly, uh, blueberries and other blue foods help to maintain a healthy weight. So for instance, if it's not blueberries, we may see things like the use of black beans. You know, when you soak black beans in water, the water turns kind of purpley, just like when you are blending up blueberries, your smoothie will turn purple. That's the anthocyanins. And so by incorporating those foods, the black beans, the blueberries, you really can have better eye health, reduced risk of cancer and better blood sugar and blood cholesterol levels. So how do we incorporate more anthocyanins, more blue for the holidays? Well, I would highly recommend if you do make baked goods for the holidays and you like to share those with friends or family that maybe you incorporate more blueberries, more fruit rather than just like a shortbread cookie. Maybe you're doing a blueberry scone because then you still get kind of a nice dry crumbly product, but you've got your anthocyanins in there. If you're a, if you're a fan of making brownies, I would try black bean brownies. There's lots of recipes online for black bean brownies. 
and black beans in the brownies adds a lot of anthocyanins. So that's a beautiful one to incorporate. And most people never know that the black beans are there. You can't really identify it once it's mixed in with the chocolate, but yet the nutrition is there. And forbidden rice, you know, when you soak forbidden rice, it's a blackish purpley rice. It also is really high in anthocyanins. And so using that to make pilafs, as opposed to maybe using a white rice or a brown rice will add more anthocyanins into the diet. So all of those are wonderful ways to get more nutrition out of what you're already accustomed to incorporating into your diet as you're going through the holidays and beyond. So our indigo foods um, are really a fun category of foods. And what I love about the indigo foods is that depending on how much you can get in, you can see a huge, huge change in blood pressure and athletic performance. So of course we have beets on the screen here, but I have a beet here too, because sometimes people get confused when it gets to the indigo and the violet, but this is the color indigo. And what I love about beets is that when you have beets in the diet, they're really versatile. You can have a savory preparation, you can have a sweet preparation. So I love a recipe by Deborah Madison for a beet risotto, but I also love having beets more in a roasted with garlic and rosemary kind of preparation. And you can put beets into chocolate cake. So there's lots of ways to incorporate this food that's high in nitric oxide. What does nitric oxide do for us? So nitric oxide is a really important nutrient for opening up our blood vessels. So often the blood vessels of someone who has high blood pressure are really, really narrow, like a narrow freeway. And so when the cars are trying to go on that one lane road, it's very slow. That's what happens with our blood on a narrow vessel. It's very slow. So in order to get it from the bottom of the feet to the top of the head, quick enough where you can get enough oxygen circulating through that blood, we have to use the kidneys to squeeze so that we can get a nice blood flow from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. But when we have more nitric oxide in the diet, it actually makes our one lane freeway a two lane freeway. And now the cars can easily just move through at a wonderful pace and not require a big squeeze. It's that squeeze that's creating elevated blood pressure. So we want less of a squeeze and more relaxed flow with a wider highway. And that's what nitric oxide does. So it does help to regulate our blood pressure. It also helps to regulate overall blood flow in the body. And because of that, runners, swimmers, bikers, skiers will actually rely on the use of nitric oxide for better performance in their sport because they've got this great flow of oxygen and their vessels are really relaxed. So they can do more for longer and not feel tuckered out. We also know that those who have a higher weight tend to have lower nitric oxide levels. And so we wanna make sure we're paying attention to that. If you are carrying more weight than you feel is optimal or than your medical professionals feel is optimal, then make sure to have more beets in the diet as well as more cherries in the diet. Those are two really great sources of nitric oxide because that will help you to keep a lower blood pressure. And it will also help you to feel like you've got more endurance, it's more gas in the tank when you're just moving through your day, when you're exercising. So there's all sorts of things we can do to improve our vitality, regardless of our size and regardless of whether or not we're having issues with our blood pressure. So for the holidays, how do we get more nitric oxide in there? Well, I love the idea of a big sheet pan of roasted red beets. When I roast my beets, um, I actually will roast them with the skins on because there's a lot of nutrition in that skin as well. So I just remove what I call the rat tail <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I will chop them up and then I put them in a, a big mixing bowl and I'll add my olive oil into that mixing bowl, my chopped garlic and maybe some sea salt and toss it like it's a salad. And then I'll dump that onto my cookie sheet so that every single piece of beet is coated in that wonderful mixture. And it really brings out the sugars as the beets cook. Um, or you can actually wrap your beets whole in parchment and foil. So if you double wrap them, parchment and then foil, you'll get a really, really moist, really nice beet that, that really keeps its juiciness. So it just depends if you like it dry, if you like it a little bit more wet, 
um, but roasted beets are just a beautiful uh, thing to add on to any holiday celebration, any holiday meal or table. And then radishes are a great source of nitric oxide as well. And so having more radishes and salads is not just going to be better for your blood pressure, not just going to be better for your athletic performance. But the other thing is the more bitter foods we eat, the less risk of cancer. So by having radishes and collard greens and mustard greens and turnip greens, all those things that you taste and go, woo, that's really bitter. We're often repelled by that as humans because our first food was milk and milk is sweet. And so our taste buds are geared towards sweet. But the bitter is really important for fighting against cancer. So I encourage everyone to really up the ante in terms of your bitter foods and you can get a bonus credit by having your nitric oxide if that bitter food is radishes. So that's a really important piece too. So if we've got a new message in the chat, does purple kale and wild rice fall into this category? So purple kale, yes, is really high in anthocyanins. It's also high in um, resveratrol, which we're about to talk about. And it has some nitric oxide but it doesn't have nearly as much nitric oxide as our beets and our cherries do and our radishes. Um, in terms of wild rice, yes, wild rice would be kind of like forbidden rice where there's a lot of anthocyanins there. Again, when you soak it in water and you see the purple water that results from soaking, that's indicative of the fact that there is that kind of bluish purple tint that we get, which is the same as what we see in blueberries. So yeah, those are very similar to each other. So when we're talking about our, our rainbow and moving through our rainbow, our violet foods, um, I just think uh, cabbage is such a beautiful art piece in and of itself. Um, but our violet foods provide a lot of resveratrol. And resveratrol is a tricky category because some of you may have heard of it. Resveratrol gets talked about a lot when people talk about red wine. They say, oh, I'm drinking red wine for heart health. Well, it's true that red wine comes from red grapes and red grapes have resveratrol, but it's not the only way to protect our hearts. And so if you're a person that is trying not to drink alcohol or is completely abstaining from alcohol, don't worry, you can get your resveratrol too. And from places that are, um, I would say, more healthful in the long run in terms of quantity that you can eat and not have any adverse effects. So resveratrol is really important for reducing the risk and the progression of various types of cancer. So whether we're looking at cancers that are cardiovascular, cancers that are related to our reproductive organs, resveratrol is a really important antioxidant for us to incorporate. And interesting research has been coming out about resveratrol for reducing the risk of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. So eating our red cabbage is doing us a world of good in terms of helping our brain too, and our brain health. And it also reduces our inflammation. So if you've, if you've got anything called an itis, bursitis, tendonitis, arthritis, all of those ITIS actually in medical speak means inflammation. So the less that you are inflamed, the more that those conditions that you have are quiet. And so by having more resveratrol, you'll actually bring down the inflammation. And we know that those with diabetes have reduced uh, severity and those who don't have diabetes have reduced risk when they have more of these purpley reddish foods that have resveratrol like the red cabbage. There was an interesting uh, set of studies that was recently done looking at candida, which is a fancy word for saying a yeast infection and whether or not resveratrol could actually work against the candida. And what was found was in high amounts of resveratrol situations, people actually were able to kill off extra candida within their bodies. So by having more of our resveratrol in the diet, you may actually have less yeast production and particularly less adverse yeast production. Some people think a little yeast is bad and you shouldn't have any at all. Most of us will have some amount of yeast in the body, but we don't want it spinning out of control. The same is true of um, looking at antibiotics. We know that when we're looking at certain bacterial infections like Campylobacter, which we often think of as like a food poisoning, um, in situations where someone had a high amount of resveratrol in the body, it will actually fight against 
that bacterial growth of Campylobacter. So a, a situation of food poisoning may not actually present as severe when you've got enough resveratrol. Whereas if you don't, it may be a really uncomfortable few days. So I highly incorporate, I highly encourage incorporating resveratrol into your diet by way of having more of our violet colored foods. Has anyone ever heard of maqui, M-A-Q-U-I? Maqui is a powder and I actually have it here. Uh, I want to show you, I don't know if you can see, that color looks probably black on the screen, but it's actually a really, really deep violet. And what maqui is, is it's a South American berry that's been powdered. And the reason it's powdered is it doesn't travel very well from South America to the US without bruising. So it gets powdered and people will incorporate it into smoothies, puddings. Um, it's beautiful. It looks like the deepest magenta you can imagine and it'll color whatever you're, you, you're making that color. But this is a huge, huge source of resveratrol. So maqui powder you can find online, you can find at grocery stores. I know that Whole Foods carries it. Um, it also is carried at New Leaf. But uh, I certainly would say with the pandemic, most of us are doing a lot of shopping online. So if you want to find it again, it's M-A-Q-U-I. And it's a beautiful way to get a lot of, a lot of resveratrol, especially if you're not eating a lot of cabbage that's red. So as we come into the holidays, a lot of times we'll have a snack bowl out or you know, we'll be cooking a big meal and not wanting to really sit down and eat something complex. So we might grab a handful of nuts. Uh, our red skinned peanuts are a beautiful source of resveratrol. So in particular, the red skinned peanuts. So I would highly recommend if you are a person that's not allergic to peanuts and you don't have anyone in your house with a peanut allergy that Maybe you are, when you buy nuts, buying red skin peanuts more often in order to get a lot of resveratrol. Also sauteing red cabbage with apples is a delicious combination. I'll often also put in red onions too, but it's a delicious combination that I recommend for a lot of resveratrol. And also, cause this is a great time of year for our cabbage and our apples, they're both in season. And so you wanna go with your red apples or get more resveratrol from a red apple. Uh, than you would from like a Granny Smith or even a yellow one. But that's a great way to get more resveratrol into your holidays. And then I think that if not maqui, you may want to consider more acai. So even though it's cold, I often will tell people, okay, it's winter, smoothies may not sound as interesting to you right now. But if you were to put ginger in with the smoothie, it actually warms it. So it's warming it once it hits the gut. You know how ginger can be warming when we eat it. So that's one trick for how to have smoothies in the winter and not feel like, oh, I'm in a cold house and now I have a cold drink is to put that ginger in there. So if you have acai and ginger in a smoothie, that's a great way to get some resveratrol as well. So I'm checking the chat here and um, someone was asking about goji berries. Do goji berries have resveratrol as well? They do, they just haven't been as well studied. When you look at charts of foods high in resveratrol, you often don't see goji berries come up, but they would have lycopene, they would have some resveratrol, they would even have a little bit of vitamin A in them. And they're actually a great source of omega-3, which most people don't realize they have omega-3 in them. So goji berries could be used in that way as well. They just haven't been studied for their resveratrol content. So lots of different things you can do to eat the rainbow during the holidays and stay really healthy. But I'd love to use the rest of our time together to ask you, you know, are there questions that you have about foods that you can incorporate for healthy holidays and also for making sure that you're eating the rainbow? And then also I'm happy to clarify any foods that may seem like they are not uh, listed on my lists, but might be high in these nutrients. For instance, I have out here a navel orange and most people say, oh, it's orange. So it's high in vitamin A. You said vitamin A is, you know, certainly signified by orange foods. Well, yes, a lot of orange foods are high in vitamin A, like our carrots and our sweet potatoes, but an orange is actually not high in vitamin A. It's one of those exceptions to our rule. So these are a wonderful source of vitamin C rather than a source of vitamin A. And growing up in the orange groves of Southern California, I had a lot of December navel oranges, um, but I certainly would say have them for their vitamin C rather than thinking, oh, I'm gonna get my vitamin A because they're orange in color. So any other 
questions that you have, I'm happy to answer. And it looks like um, we might have another one coming through right now. Okay, yeah, Nikki's just letting you know you can add your questions in the chat if you have any, I'm happy to answer them. But I do wanna make sure that you know, you're know you eating the rainbow as much as possible. Um, there is a comment here recently, I have included Native American food in my diet, such as acorn, which is lovely. Um, and so when you're having something like acorn and it's new to you, you just wanna make sure because it is higher in fiber, and I would imagine maybe you're soaking and doing preparations once soaked, but because it's higher in fiber, you will want to make sure that you're also having plenty of water when you're having acorn and other Native American traditional foods, because the more fiber, the more gas, unless you have a lot of water with them. And so whenever someone says, I'm gonna up my fruits and vegetables, I'm gonna have more seeds and nuts and beans, I always say that's phenomenal, do it but make sure that your water matches that increase so that you're not having a lot of gas because that can be, be uncomfortable. Any other questions that you have that I can answer for you? Um, yes, you have it leached with water. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in terms of demoing recipes, uh, there's a question about what would I suggest for recipes for teenagers? Uh, that they could make easily at home. So in terms of things teenagers can make easily at home, I have a teenager, so I get it. Um, there's a lot of different things, but smoothies are one thing that comes to mind. I feel like a lot of teenagers love the idea that they get to choose what goes into it. They get to choose the color. And so smoothies are a great one. In addition to smoothies, it uh, depends on if that teenager is vegan, vegetarian, or an omnivore. But I like the idea of scrambles. So it can be an egg scramble with vegetables or a tofu scramble with vegetables. For my daughter, she's so busy that what I often will do is I will prepare vegetables so that she can just easily throw them in. Because if she has to wash and chop them, it's probably not gonna happen. And so if they're prepared and they're in a clear glass container at eye level in the fridge, and she's got like her 20 minute lunch break, she can easily Put that together. And so I do recommend pre-chopping vegetables for teenagers if you also have busy teens uh, who don't have the time or don't perceive they have the time for doing that. Uh, and then I love the idea of doing more big sheet pans of roasted foods with teenagers. So I love to do what I call kind of a rainbow roast where it's some carrots and some beets and some sweet potato. Maybe we do turnips and rutabaga in there because we want to get our bitters in. Um, and then you've got all these beautiful colors, lots from the rainbow, lots of antioxidants, um, and they can do the tossing and they can add the herbs and then they get roasted. And there's a lot available then for everyone to eat off of for a few days. You can always add in tempeh or, te or chicken or um, have it with a fish on the side as a way to get some protein in there. But that's a great one for teenagers as well. Yeah, any other questions that you all have? So wonderful, you have lots of great input. Uh, any suggestions for foods to eat or avoid for folks who tend to have kidney stones? So if you have kidney stones, we're really looking at trying to minimize your oxalates, but not avoid oxalates. And doctors may give misinformation and say, you have kidney stones, no oxalates. And so some with kidney stones will then say, oh, I'm not allowed to eat any spinach. It's not true that you can't have any spinach or any chard or any beet greens it is that you need to have a smaller amount of them. So what I mean by that is maybe you have one cup cooked three times a week, as opposed to every single day. Instead of having a smoothie where you say, I always put kale or I always put spinach in that smoothie. Maybe you're swapping that out and doing more cucumber in your smoothie. Maybe you're doing a little bit more lettuce in your smoothie for those greens because those are lower in oxalates. The other concern for those with kidney stones is calcium. And what a lot of people will do is they will flood the body with too much calcium. And that can be a little bit harder to excrete the other minerals because there's so much calcium there, it becomes the preoccupation in terms of what we excrete. So I would recommend that you look at whether you're taking Tums, you look at whether or not you've got uh, any other hidden calciums in the diet through medications and that you're not taking all of this calcium you need for strong bones in the form of a vitamin pill, 
or a mineral pill, but instead that you're getting most of it from your food and that you're having plenty of water. It's really important to flush with lots and lots of water in order to avoid kidney stones, as well as having plenty of magnesium citrate in the diet, which you can have by having those dark leafy greens. Um, so again, goes back to our lettuces and um, not focusing so much on the, the spinaches and so forth like that. So you're not getting oxalates and adding a little bit of lemon juice on there in preparation will help to break down some of the minerals so that you don't have kidney stones presenting as large or as often. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment here, prickly pear for kidney stones, um, tuna in Spanish, yes. Uh, however, we don't know if that is something that we can use to prevent kidney stones or whether it's only to be used to address kidney stones once they've already, already occurred, but it's a phenomenal inclusion in the diet. So I think tuna is a great, great one to have on board for overall strengthening of the kidneys. There's just questions about whether it's better for prevention or for treatment. Also a question about, can I touch on the importance of water intake and how it affects the assimilation of nutrients? Is there a formula? So water is your highway. It's the way you get all your nutrients into your cells. So you could eat the most gorgeous salad on the planet with every color represented, lots of diversity of vegetables every day, but all of those nutrients can't get in if you're dehydrated. So you've got to make sure that you're having enough water to push all of your nutrients into your cells. The best way to make sure you have enough water is that you want to have as a bare bones minimum, take your weight, divide it in half, and that's the number of ounces of water you need per day. Most people have been taught wrong about how much water they need per day and wrong about how much protein they need per day. It's your weight divided in half, and that's the number of ounces of water as your minimum per day. There are lots of things that affect how much extra water you might need or how much you might need to bring that down. If you're on a diuretic, we may need to watch how much water you should take in. So hydrochlorothiazide is an example of a diuretic for people with high blood pressure. If you are a person that has a lot of sodium in the diet, you're probably gonna need more. So if you're eating more meals that are prepared out of the house at a restaurant, that's usually higher salt, you'll need more water. Um, and if you have a chronic kidney disease, we have to really make sure you're getting enough water so that we can continue to help push things through the kidneys. So at the bare bones minimum, half your, your weight in ounces per day. And then it, it varies if you're an athlete and you're sweating more, you'll need more. And if you're someone who is having hard, harder time holding your water, we might have you take in less. Any other questions that everyone has? Such a pleasure to be able to share this information with you right before the holidays. And I know eating is going to get a little interesting in the next few weeks for everybody. Want to make sure that these foods are front and center. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes. Do you have anything else to add? I'm sorry. No, I'm good. Thank you. Well, I am always just riveted whenever you <laughs> share with us. There's so much to learn and know, and I've got pages of notes. And uh, like we said, we will be sharing um, a link to the recording with everyone. And I'm happy to facilitate a recipe share. Um, I have all the registrants emails and um, I can work on that for us tomorrow as well. So. Um, if there aren't any more questions, um, oh, here's one here from- Hitty. Any suggestions for how much white rice versus brown rice to eat? Um, it, it depends on the person. So if you said to me, oh, my blood sugar is tending high or I haven't had it checked, I don't actually know what it is. I would recommend much more brown, wild and forbidden rice than white rice because it's gonna be higher fiber, not necessarily lower carb, but higher fiber. So it'll be more slow moving sugar. Um, and we know there's just more B vitamins, more minerals overall in rice that is not white. So white is okay once in a while, but I would tend toward more brown, wild, forbidden. There's green rices and red rices, um, beautiful options now. So the more you can incorporate those colors, the better. Uh, there's a question, what do I think about drinking coffee? 
Um, well, it's not so much what I think as a dietitian. I will often tell people I'm just looking at the science and trying to communicate the science rather than going on opinion. Um, the science says that if you have a history of Alzheimer's in your family, that some coffee can actually be quite supportive of reducing your risk for Alzheimer's. So that is a, that's a, a yes for coffee. Um, if you don't have Alzheimer's in the family, um, there's not a high risk that's been indicated, then we have to look at your bone health. Bone health is adversely affected by coffee drinking because coffee is very acidic. And in being acidic, it can actually leach some of the calcium from the bone. So if you're a person dealing with osteoporosis and osteopenia in the family, you may wanna really watch your coffee intake because of the fact that it is so acidic. And people say, well, if I add milk to it, doesn't that balance it out? It doesn't, milk is actually quite acidic as well. It's why we say lactic acid is a part of milk. So just depends on who you are, but I think overall, um, a little coffee probably fine, you know, more than eight ounces in a day can be problematic for bone health, depending on the person. What would I recommend for people who have cravings very often and have trouble with balancing portions? More foods that are harder to chew. So if you often are having cravings, sometimes what happens is let's say the craving is sugar. If you say, well, I'm just gonna have a little bit today. I'm gonna have half of what I usually have. Your brain gets tickled. Your brain kind of goes to a party. And when you stop that party, your brain goes, but I like the party. Can't we just go back? And so we want to try to dial back our refined sugar overall because it is triggering our dopamine receptors to be so hyperactivated that it makes us want to have that hyperactivity happen again. So I recommend having more things that are harder to chew so that let's say you like your cookies and this time of year you have a favorite cookie. I would rather see you sit down to a bowl of carrots and cucumbers with your favorite hummus or other dip and get all the way through that before you launch into your cookies. And what will often happen is that fiber expands in the stomach and makes you so full that you'll end up eating less of the cookies than if you would have had your cookie first and said, oh, I'll have my carrots and my cucumbers later. So hard to chew foods are great when you're trying to really address cravings. Any other last minute questions? Oh, there, I can add something else too in terms of having trouble balancing portions. Um, if you're a person that tends to eat a larger portion than you think is needed for your own body and your own energy level, I would recommend you can eat with your non-dominant hand. Very frustrating, takes a long time, but it'll slow you down. You can also eat with chopsticks instead of eating with a fork. That will slow you down. And some people will eat with an appetizer fork instead of eating with a full-sized fork because you can't get as much on the tines in one fell swoop. And of course, chewing often is really important. So I will often tell my patients, chew every bite until it feels like oatmeal in your mouth. And if you do that before swallowing, it really slows you down and incorpor incorporates more enzymes so that you are actually feeling that sense of fullness more than if you were eating quickly. All right, I'm wondering if there are, you're welcome. I'm wondering if there are any last questions. If not, we'll close for today, but I'll be sure to send my collard green recipe to Nikki and she can get that out to you. Yeah, thank you all for attending. And again, thank you, Jocelyn, for your time and wisdom. Oh, looks like there's one more message here. Oh, thanks. Thanks you all. <laughs> Have a great day and uh, I'll send that follow-up email um, tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jocelyn.